Hi everyone, here's the Chemist once again, and today I'm reviewing The Mysteries of Pittsburgh by Michael Chabon, sort of my favorite writer. As I mentioned in a recent video, in the next few months I'll be working on a few Chabon specific projects for my PhD and my research, and since it's been quite a few years since I last read uh, several of his works, uh, early this year, early in 2019, I plan to reread uh, some of his stuff, starting from Pittsburgh. Uh, the Mysteries of Pittsburgh, in my memory, uh, is, uh, stands alongside the final solution as what I'd call my least favorite Chabon's novel. Uh, leaving, I'm only talking about novels, let's leave the short stories aside, but whereas I wasn't necessarily very impressed with Final Solution, because maybe that's not quite the book for me, but that's also a very particular, very peculiar kind of novel. I believe what didn't impress me uh, too much about Pittsburgh is that when I first read it, it seemed to me to be the most what I, uh, the most generic among Chabon's novels, as in the one that falls most neatly and most unimpressively in a specific genre, uh, which is literary fiction, uh, or even a specific subgenre, which is that of the debut novel. Did I change my mind with this rereading? Should you read The Mysteries of Pittsburgh? Why should you? Let's see. Last year, in my review of Lisa Halliday's Asymmetry, one of my very favorite books from 2018, I mentioned that that book almost feels as if it's a study of the debut novel as a literary type, uh, just as much as Mysteries of Pittsburgh. But whereas uh, Asymmetry, also because of its very peculiar narrative structure, has a very engineered feel to it, Mysteries of Pittsburgh feels much more spontaneous in the way it deals with themes, uh, and the way it is narrated in certain, um, uh, using certain tropes that very much point to that concept of a young writer exploring their gifts their writing gifts and dealing with the stuff of youth, finding their voice, whatever that is, concerning themselves with themes that are very dear to them. And uh, by the way, this idea that one novel is engineered, the other is spontaneous, has nothing to do with whether each, uh, uh, either of these writers actually sat down and told themselves, well, I am going to write a debut novel, first because that sounds highly unlikely, and second because authorial intention uh, is one of those things that people don't really give a shit about, and if you think about it for a second, why should they? Mysteries of Pittsburgh is a very effervescent account of a young man uh, who is at the end of his university career, he, he is about to go out into the world, and he meets a few interesting people in the course of a summer, and he has adventures with them. And it is peopled by a plethora of very interesting characters, and in particular by three supporting characters that are quite unforgettable. Uh, Cleveland, the intellectual beatnik, um, as fun as he is scary, uh, Arthur, very fashionable, very sly, and Flox, who is eccentric and homophobic. And all of these characters are much better developed and much more three-dimensional than the actual protagonist, the narrator. Uh, it's mentioned sometimes that the narrator is a clever young man, but that's as far as his characterization sort of goes, or at least I don't have a very clear picture of him in my head. At times he looks very awkward, but at the same time people seem to ad adore him for reasons, but that is also fine. This rather blurry <laughs> characterization when it comes to the protagonist is very fine, because one of the key ideas in this novel, uh, which is developed throughout the entire uh, mysteries, is how this main character comes to think of himself and comes to shape his personality through these people. Very often in the course of the novel, the narrator mentions his puzzlement at the very fact that these interesting people even want to be his friends. And this captures beautifully, together with some other reflections, how these people shape what is the main character's potential as a human being and help him understand what he wants in 
um, future in terms of his future, in terms of his sexual orientation, in terms of his life companions, and more. The main character is a young man, he is in his early 20s, but he has the attitude and outlook of someone even younger. According to his father, he is doomed to terminal adolescence, and he compares some of the experiences he has in the course of this summer to other experiences he had in the fourth grade, when every afternoon, every conversation with friends was enshrouded in boundless potential. Once more, that's the key term. Uh, it's summoned again in the final paragraph of the novel. Uh, this summer uh, sort of ha has a magical vibe to it. The Borges epigraph of the novel goes, we have shared out like thieves the amazing treasure of nights and days, and it is the perfect epigraph for this novel, which might as well have been called the treasures of Pittsburgh. All of these people, the narrator's friends, uh, appear and are often compared to kings or celebrities or starlets. They become larger than life in the narrator's eyes, their traits and idiosyncrasies are described as almost legendary and equally magical is everything that basically happens to the narrator every time he visits a house, a strange house where something uh, idiots happened in the past, or when he visits a neighborhood in Pittsburgh he had never truly explored. All of these experiences are enshrouded in the tones of adventures. And look, I probably should tell you already, don't expect too many monsters or explosions to occur in the course of the novel, but still, the way all of these, every single chapter, every little experience this guy has in the course of the summer is turned into a minor adventure, is into a sort of secondary quest. That is probably the genius thing of Mysteries of Pittsburgh, because it captures beautifully that feeling of boundless potential once again that the guy, the narrator, has at the beginning of this magical summer. When it comes to these larger-than-life characters, I have to admit they are all sort of obnoxious as intellectual, ambitious young people very often tend to be, uh, and uh, whereas some of these are clearly engineered in the text to appear obnoxious, Flox Lombardi, above all, I mentioned she's homophobic, uh, it's not like the other characters, people like Arthur, are really that much better. And again, when I talk about these things, I talk about characters being engineered to appear a certain way, I'm thinking about what the text does, the actual narration does, that has nothing to do with whether Chaven wanted or not to make them look a certain way. Way. And by the way, uh, did you notice that Flox Lombardi has an Italian surname, but she's obsessed with all things French, whereas Arthur Lecomte has a French surname, but he uh, likes Italian food and dresses sharp. I had some close reading for you. And in the way these kids are, uh, you know, annoying kids because they're young and beautiful and have fun, but still they're miserable, uh, some people are going to be annoyed by that. Uh, these characters reminded me a lot uh, of the people in Jonathan Lethem's You Don't Know Me Yet, who are also young, who also have big dreams that maybe do not have a very specific shape beyond I'd like to be famous and to be maybe a musician. Um, and uh, lots of people dislike uh, You Don't Love Me Yet for precisely that reason, because they find the characters obnoxious. And I feel like people may have the same problem with Pittsburgh. And I know of people who really disliked Pittsburgh because they couldn't connect to the characters. But once again, I would urge you to take this as a study of character. You don't necessarily have to be friends with these people, because again, all of them are rather bad if you th stop and think about it for a while, but at the same time you can find them interesting, you can uh, read about them, maybe you can see the, the many good sides all of them have. I've been mentioning several times how this book refers to the boundless potential of this summer, but the first time I read through it, I didn't pick up how much about summer this book is. This is a study of summer as a season, uh, summer as lived through a young man, just out of college, sort of. It captures beautifully summer as the season of relative freedom, uh, the season where the world is in bloom, everything is good, the sky is amazing, uh, the city uh, shines at all times of the day, the sun never quite sets, uh, July is the moment when uh, your freedom sorts of falls into a specific schedule, 
which is true if you are a young person um, still sort of in college or fresh out of it. If, like me, summer is your favorite season, that's already a good reason to read The Mysteries of Pittsburgh and also Summerland, which I'll probably be discussing uh, in a few weeks. Now, Mysteries of Pittsburgh has a very clear plot at its core, which revolves around the love triangle. And when it was first marketed, it was marketed largely as a gay novel, even a work that falls into that very specific subgenre and the LGBT themes in the novel are definitely there. Uh, especially, paradoxically, especially in its first half, later into the novel, maybe the narrator's self-absorption um, sort of weakens the discussion of those themes. But besides that, I do not necessarily think that um, you know, these LGBT themes are all there is to the mysteries of Pittsburgh. There's so much more to the novel and its concerns with uh, Summer, his concerns with the boundless potential of a young man just out of college. This stuff seems to me at least equally important to the novel's balance as the narrator's love misadventures with Phlox and Arthur. Uh, at the same time, I felt like some, if I have to be nitpicking and petty, I felt like some subplots here and there, maybe a chapter or two, felt maybe a bit superfluous. Maybe they didn't contribute anything especially relevant to the plot or to the novel's development. Uh, it's sort of a truism that debut novels tend to be uh, packed with stuff because maybe uh, debut writers, um, young writers, feel like they have to cram lots of characters and lots of subplots into their work, some of which are not necessarily needed. But it's not like these passages are necessarily too boring. Also, and we reach the other genius thing about the mysteries of Pittsburgh, uh, because Chabon just writes like a motherfucker. I just love the way Chabon writes so much. I've uh, started rereading Wonder Boys, his second novel, which came a few years after Pittsburgh for reasons, and I have to admit that the comparison is brutal, uh, as in Wonder Boys is so... Wonder Boys is the kind of novel that when I'm reading it at home I have to read it out loud because I just like the way it is written so much, I just like the way Chabon uses six words where one would suffice, the way he tells you about all sorts of digressions, the way he uses similes all the time, the way he has to describe people with uh, four or five things, one or two wouldn't suffice. I love that type of freely baroque writing, I grew up reading Lovecraft, but at the same time Pittsburgh too Two already features all of that, uh, at least in potential. I'm a sucker for endings, so I'm going to read you the last paragraph of Pittsburgh, which goes, When I remember that dizzy summer, that dull, stupid, lovely, dire summer, it seems that in those days I ate my lunches, smelled another skin, noticed a shade of yellow, even simply sat with greater lust and hopefulness, and that I lusted with greater faith, hoped with greater abandon. The people I loved were celebrities, surrounded by rumor and fanfare. The places I sat with them, movie lots and monuments. No doubt all of this is not true remembrance, but the ruinous work of nostalgia, which obliterates the past. And no doubt, as usual, I have exaggerated everything. If that doesn't give you goosebumps, maybe Pittsburgh is not a book for you, but I love this style of writing just so much. And I feel that if you enjoy this type of writing, if you enjoy rather, once again, Baroque writing, Pittsburgh is, can, is going to be a pleasure just because of the way you'll be able to enjoy it. How fun Chabon's jokes are, how extravagant his characterizations, how effervescent his descriptions of the most mundane things. Did my opinion of Pittsburgh improve upon rereading? It did. I actually noticed quite a few very interesting and very uh, fascinating things about the novel that I hadn't picked up at all upon my first read. Uh, and in my circles, uh, when a novel improves upon rereading, that's what we call a good sign. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this review. If you're interested in anything I mentioned, might be the, the book for you. If you've read Mysteries of Pittsburgh, if you may be interested in reading it, um, let me know in the comments by all means. Let me know what you think about the novel in the comments below. And in a second, I'll put links on the screen to some others of my videos. Uh, thank you as always for watching, guys, and bye, guys.